the seasons have turned yet again. The air chills. The leaves are crisp underfoot, and the colors of the world start to reflect the death that it brings. This year, however, the fear associated with Halloween, which is often lighthearted, seems to have crept out of the TV and into our daily lives. I don't know about you, but taking a walk or visiting a cemetery are no longer the safe havens they were in the past. The disfigured clowns and dancing skeletons remind me less of the laughter of children and more of the suffering of those around me. Still, there's no better time than now to contemplate and face the reality of death. Our guest this episode is none other than renowned death expert, Caitlin Doty. The ghoul who needs no introduction, if you will. Her newest book, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? Big Questions from Tiny Mortals About Death, is a bubbling cauldron of post-mortem practices which turn the dreadful into delightful and the blood-curdling into the beguiling. When many of us need a reassuring hand to guide us through difficult topics, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs becomes a welcome companion into exploring the world of death. So, Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. I'd like to start by asking a bit about your background, where the desire to be an advocate for thinking about death began and how that developed for you. But also, uh, since this is a goth podcast, I feel like I'm obliged to ask if any kind of alternative subculture played into your life or your interest in death. That's a great question. And the answer is absolutely. So I grew up, was born and raised until I was 18 years old in Hawaii. And uh-huh. I think that you've probably found this. Places like Florida, places like Hawaii actually mm-hmm. have more of a thriving goth community than you would expect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the curse of the sunlight or something, mm-hmm. or you feel like you don't belong <laughs> and you find comfort in the darkness. Who knows? Yeah. But I definitely was, at a young age, drawn to death in general. Um, very interested in darker things. And in high school specifically, that really manifested as being interested in the gothic subculture. And there were two clubs in Waikiki in downtown Honolulu. Uh, One was called Flesh and one was (laughs) called The Dungeon. Classic. And uh, one of those was a fetish club that I should not have been going to at age 16 (laughs) and 17, but Uh I always managed to get into. Um, But I was actually thinking about this today in advance of being on this podcast about how overwhelmingly positive my memories are of going to those places and those spaces Mm. and being able to be with the music, being able to be around other people who looked like me, who were interested in the same things as I was. And they always treated me very well and fairly and openly. And Mm. I have nothing but, but good things to say about that time in my life. And that is wonderful to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And so I love, and I will say like, as far as, whether or not I still identify as goth, I think that I wouldn't only because I know friends of mine and other adults who are about that life. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I am certainly about that death life, um, (laughs) but I don't know how deeply I could claim to be in full understanding of a goth subculture anymore, even though I am surrounded by it and I know a lot of people who who are involved in it. Yeah, but I will enough. say that it was very formative for me um, to to be in those spaces, and because I was, you know, this was nineteen, probably the year two thousand. <laughs> oh God, I'm old now, two thousand <laughs> or two thousand one. The internet was a thing. I could download, you know, Assemblage twenty three albums, Bauhaus albums. I could have access to all this music that I wouldn't really have access into Hawaii. Um, 
in Hawaii 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier. Um, so I could participate in ways that I probably wouldn't have been able to um, if I had been born in a different time. But uh, this, is, this is a long-winded explanation of this. But then I went to college. I went to college in Chicago, and I was a medieval history major. And yeah. I was interested specifically in not only the late medieval witch trials, but also late medieval art of the macabre or death art and uh, burial practices and death practices of the late medieval. And so that was my academic interest. But when I moved to San Francisco after college, you know, there's not really a job for witchcraft theorist. There should be, but that wasn't a real job. So I took a job at a crematory. And that was, I guess, 13 years ago now. And that has kind of been my whole life ever since that time. Very cool. Yeah, I did. It was funny because I was looking around at uh, the interviews you've done and I've I've followed your YouTube channel uh, since almost, I think, when it when you created it. But even even some of the interviews you did this year, I saw the the websites using the, the word goth somewhere in the description. And I just thought it was funny that that's still a cultural touch point for people to think, ah, yes, the weird macabre people, those are the goths. Absolutely. Right. And it's so funny because I think that real, you know, people deep in the scene wouldn't be like, oh, my sister, you know, you're obviously totally steeped in this. So it's it's sort of lazy in that sense. Yeah. Um, and I could see how it would be frustrating for actual goths to have this person who is, you know, having a Betty Page haircut <laughs> doesn't make you goth. Like working at a funeral home doesn't make you goth. Like these are these are kind of lazy associations but um i I guess it does it does yeah yeah and i guess it does speak to the um the permanence of the goth subculture Mm. as being still a relevant indicator of someone because it's not an insult you know it it may Mm. be used as a sort like slightly pejorative as like Mm -hmm. oh that we want a way to have it make sense yeah you know oh this is why she she's an advocate for death and and death awareness not because of like the hugely unjust capitalistic funeral industrial complex but because mm-hmm. she's a goth mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and like yeah. and like to be clear those things like don't have to be mutually exclusive either but yeah. but it is it it is sort of lazy but also you know i, I don't mind it certainly i mean i i think f- from my experience i've found i've tended to find that the understanding of death in goth culture is often more of a aesthetic or romanticized understanding rather than a grounded real life understand because that's you know when someone sent me your website when it first launched order of the good death and uh i remember feeling both validated in the sense that here are people talking about uh death advocacy but also realizing that I was not as familiar with the process or realities of death as I thought I was just because I was in a culture that talked about death. Um, so yeah, the, the associations are there, but they're not always as deep as one might think. So, Well, but that's a really good point because though what I'm trying to bring to people is a very baseline relationship and understanding with death. And I think that my advocacy is absolutely universal. You should know what happens in a cremation. You should know what happens in a burial or an embalming. You should know what happens behind the scenes in the funeral industry because people used to take care of their own dead and be incredibly mm. intimate with the death process. And that's something everything should everybody should know. However, not everybody is going to come to it with a gothic sensibility. Not yeah. everyone yeah. is going to come with that aesthetic sensibility, with that desire to appreciate the art and mm-hmm. the music and the literature of of that period. It's it's not going to be for everyone. And I happen to have a lot of crossover with those interests. You know, I love an old Vanitas painting. Mm. I love gothic literature. Um I love those things, but I don't necessarily think that those things are what inform my advocacy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I I get a bit grumpy with goths sometimes about uh, cemeteries because I think that we should see cemeteries as not just a place to mourn, but as a place, uh, sort of a repository of history and art and culture. And some, I see some goths treating them as like, oh, this is our weird thing and being kind of disrespectful about what they're doing there 
death is a universal, right? So it's like you said, um, it's something that we need to share with others. We don't get to just keep it to ourselves. Yeah. Right. And I, and I do wonder, and, and this is sort of, I don't know if I'm a threat to the Gothic subculture <laughs> in that way, because what I am saying is that you know, cemeteries used to be a place of social interaction. You yeah. used to go and have carriage rides and carriage races and picnics, and it was an incredibly social place to see and be seen. And that's obviously changed. And 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 taking care of the of the dead was something that you did in your community and you did with your family, and that's changed. And so yeah. some, and I'm not saying this is the heart of of being goth in any sense, but there is a kind of um, being delighted by the taboo of it. You know, yeah. there is a there is right, a feeling right. of I'm in this cemetery where others fear to tread, mm-hmm. and I yeah. am interested in behind the scenes of of being an embalmer or the funeral industry where others fear to tread, and then you have me being like everyone tread on in, like come on in, <laughs> everybody needs to know this, everybody should see it. I'm happily showing you all of this, mm-hmm. and you know I can see why in some ways that sort of takes away i mean it's same thing with like a fetish community if everyone you know mm, is like i'm yeah. so kinky it's like yeah. okay, where's the, <laughs> yeah. the joy in that anymore yeah we've had discussions yeah. on the show about you know when when goths seem to value the obscurity of their hobbies and their interests rather than sure. just reveling in them because they love them they just they like the fact that it's like i said transgressive or obscure or odd and that's a thing and then there's also the the stereotypical goth checklist of have you had sex in a cemetery? Oh, check that box off, uh, yeah, which yeah. is in, inherently problematic. How many pumpkins have you put up your ass? You know, kind of <laughs> I mean, that's I still, you know, because I have yet to put a pumpkin up my ass is why I cannot <laughs> fully call myself goth. And yeah, I admit it's that actually, to you today. It, yeah, we'll send you the card once we reach that point. Um, but at least from my perspective, it seems like you are kind of the voice of death positivity and and advocacy for talking about those things. Um, So, you know, going from working in a funeral home to putting out this website to being a published author and and giving lectures and doing all these interviews, I'm, I'm just curious how that has kind of changed your life. And also if you found that you had to struggle to get to that point and gain recognition as a woman um, in the funeral industry? Yeah, that's a lovely question. Thank you. Um, I think that in some ways my life hasn't changed all that much. You know, I've, I've worked either in funeral homes or owned funeral homes, which is a different thing entirely, but, Mm, but it, you know, I've been in the funeral industry basically the whole time. Um, I've been writing the whole time. I've been making this web series the whole time. I think that in many ways, the slow burn and the slow rise of myself as an advocate and recognition of me and how many eyeballs I have on my advocacy has been very, very positive because you really, to be able to be a woman on the internet, the only way to do it is kind of to be a lobster in a pot where Mm. it's getting hotter and hotter Mm -hmm. and hotter, but you just get used to it. And I hope that I don't eventually die. That's not the metaphor, but (laughs) the idea is that, that if, if I was just thrown into it, totally, you know, blew up overnight Right. I wouldn't be able to handle it at all in in no way because it's there's a lot going on and there's a and I've seen a lot of other death positive advocates that potentially have a really good message and are very smart people but they start to get obsessed with how much press they're getting or mm. how people are seeing them or perceived attacks online and it just makes them bonkers like it it absolutely drives them drives them off a cliff like they can't they can't handle it because it is a weird hard job to talk about this very difficult thing that most people don't want to talk about yeah so if you're not in it for it sounds like the bachelor like if you're not in it for the right reasons um <laughs> but if you're not if you're not there purely for your advocacy and not about your ego you won't last very long doing it and i think yeah. that's true for any sort of advocacy or public advocacy that that people do um and luckily this is just my obsession and it's what i care about and it's what has kept me going and i'm very lucky now that 
if I, I don't have to do every interview, I don't have to, to do all of these things because there are people who are incredible advocates in their own right, who I can send people to, new people I can feature, who are doing interesting work, who are charismatic and, and fun and completely carry on the message that I, that I wanted to share. Um, yeah. So I get to feel like I'm part of a community and that I can s- afford to step back a little bit as well. Yeah. And so I, I feel actually like I'm in sort of a good place with it at the moment. Very good. So I have to, uh, just because of what's happening in the world, I have to kind of get your opinion on the pandemic and how you feel about the ways that COVID have revealed our and and laid bare our relationship with death and our view of death and if you if you feel like anything has changed or anything will change (sighs) i hope so yeah I, i i can really hope so i think one of the best examples i have is if you remember in the first months of the pandemic when they had the reveal of the drones flying over heart island um off new york yeah where it was, you know, they were burying the indigent dead in rows in trenches. And the headlines were just horror discovered, mass fatalities, pandemic buried in mass pit. You know, what is happening? They've been burying people like that in Hart Island for over 100 years. There are a few more people buried there because, you know, surprise, it's a pandemic and New York was hit especially hard. But this has been going on, burying of homeless and indigent dead on Hart Island for such a long time. They use prison labor to do it. And if you have a problem with that, good, welcome. Yeah. You know, come on down, learn about this, join join other people. And I, I think what we're finding now, which is very similar to other things like Medicare for all, um, or people who deal with workers' rights, people who have been doing this work for years, and all of a sudden, because of the pandemic, people are going, hey, wait a second, this is not fair how we distribute money from the government. It's not yeah. fair how we do health care. And all these people uh, are like, yes, welcome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come yeah. on down. Like, mm-hmm. help us do this. We're so glad you're here. And I, see, I do see a version of that happening with death, with people saying, wait a second, like coming out of this pandemic, I can't spend twelve thousand dollars for a simple funeral. Mm-hmm. I can't, you know. I feel so disconnected from death. I was kept from my mom's death because of COVID. That made me feel terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All those things should make you feel bad. It should make you feel terrible that you can't be, you know, with your mom while she's dying or help in the funeral and grieving process. It's bad that the funeral is twelve thousand dollars. Like all of these things are not good and i hope that this will push people to want something different and to want to change and what we do know historically is that after every mass death event in the united states history like the civil war world war 1 world war 2 the pandemic of 1918 there has been a real shift in the funeral industry following that mm. mass death event. And so my hope is that that real shift isn't like we all do Zoom funerals now, but that it's you know something more <laughs> close to my own advocacy, which is family involvement, lower costs, more government intervention to help people cover and pay for, yeah. for funeral costs so you don't have to end up in the trench on Hard Island. Yeah. Um, and just a different, a different sense of what a funeral can be. I think what this has highlighted for me, and actually I was just reading an NPR article about this, but the fact that uh, you have minorities, you kind of have have the two different Americas, right? You have minorities and then white people and people who are uh, more upper class uh, where you've had, you have these communities that were set up due to systemic inequalities through actions like redlining and stuff like that, where um, they're mostly minorities and they, they don't have access to proper health care, to, to good quality food. They don't have access for uh, to be able to work from home, right? They, they can't – they don't have the resources needed to follow these sort of social distancing guidelines and these other things that are set up. And then they get judged more harshly by society for that. Uh, the police treat them worse. They don't have the um, economic resources that – white people have there. I don't remember the exact statistic, but, uh, 
there is a large disparity also in unemployment as well because the system was already set up to deprioritize these people to disadvantage people of color. And then when you have a pandemic hit, it really just aggravates those existing inequalities. And I think that's been uh, the biggest takeaway for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that people, because of the financial aspect of the pandemic and, like you said, the the racial, the economic disparities of the pandemic, I I do hope that people say, hey, wait a second, why is it that there's no government support for funerals at all? Like some individual states have support um, that you have to apply for, and you, it's not that much. It's $300, $500 if you're lucky. No federal support at all. I hope that it makes people go, wait a second, so you're forcing people to mm, go to a private yeah. business? That's, you know, it's there's no, there's no federal aid or help. Yeah. It's not like you can prevent death. Death is going to happen. And when it happens, you're forcing people to go to a private mm. business? That's weird. And funerals are yeah. the only place that that happens. So, so I was going to uh, bring this up as well. You've been all over the world um, and you've seen a whole diverse set of death practices and, and cultures. Um, I, I do want to hear about some of those, but I'm also interested in how that may have changed your own understanding of the world and, and the ways that we treat the living and the dead. Well, I think I had a hypothesis before I left. And I, I mean, I obviously this happened over many years, but my general hypothesis was other cultures had more realistic, mm. better involvement with their dead than we did. Um, and then also there was no way to judge a culture for their death rituals just by looking mechanically at what was done. So one of the biggest examples of this is when I went to South Sulawesi, which is this very, very isolated community in this place called Tana Taraja, where they take out the mummies of their dead every two years and they clean them. They have a festival. They clean the mummified body of grandpa. They walk him around the village. They, they bring him cigarettes, his offerings. They change his clothes. They're incredibly interactive with their dead bodies. And they believe that there's a continuing relationship that actually sits within the dead body, like that, that they could talk to the mummy and, and mm. there's some sort of interaction there. And you go and you see it and it feels completely normal. It feels like a potluck picnic that happens to have mummies at it. And the family and the community are pe are completely involved. And if it was someone who died recently, there's crying because they miss the person so much and children are there and they're involved. And it feels very normalized. It feels very welcoming. Um, and when you look at pictures of the ceremony online, it will just be flooded with comments from Western countries, probably mostly America, that's like, oh, mm. God, disgusting. Why can't you let these people rest in peace? How dare you, you know, play with the dead like this? What are you thinking? It's like, what, what are you thinking telling this culture how they're supposed to handle their dead and how they're supposed yeah. to grieve? especially since what they're doing is so much more interactive and meaningful yeah. than what we're doing here in America. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to mention in, in conjunction with that is um, when things like traditional practices, religious practices, et cetera, can pose a risk to the population. And how do you, how do you address things like that? I'm thinking primarily of uh, the cases of Ebola in West Africa where some of the practices of being very intimate with the bodies, the, the family washing the body, the family caretaking it, has promoted the spread or seems to promote the spread of the disease and how to address that or if, is there any way to address that while still maintaining the cultural sensitivity to understand that that's their practice but that it is also endangering their community to some degree? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'm glad you bring that up because first of all, people should know that Ebola, so far as we know, is really one of the only diseases, infectious diseases that we need to be concerned about right now as far as transmitting after death. And to be clear, we're still not sure with COVID-19, although there's a lot of evidence to suggest that 
it's not going to be infectious at all after death, especially now that we know that it doesn't really stay on surfaces that long. Um, and also the way that the virus encapsulates is different from Ebola and other more infectious viruses. Um, so I really, I, my guess at this point, don't quote me on this, would be that, that it's going to be safe. But what we do know is that dead bodies are safe to be around. And that's why other cultures like in West Africa have incredibly intimate relationships with their dead. They wash them. They, they sing and dance around them. They weep, they wail, they hold their hands. They're, they have a very moving ritual around death. And it is when something like Ebola comes, which is basically you're talking about just immediate cremation or immediate burial. No one should be around that body at all. It's actually very similar to what we've been dealing with with at the beginning of COVID in the United States, where the bodies just disappear. You know, they get taken from from mm. the hospital and get immediately cremated. And it's horrifying and very, very sad. And death rituals are so, so, so important to a culture, especially cultures that still take death rituals very, very seriously. And so to not have that I don't, I don't know that there's much that you can do other than explain the reality and know that the grief is going to be complicated for a lot of people because they don't have that ability to move forward. It's the same thing as like a body that goes overseas to fight a war and disappears and dies or is blown into pieces and goes down in a plane crash and you never see them again. You have to deal with that kind of un, unfulfilled grief, unrealized grief. And the body does so much to help people accept the reality of death. And I don't even know what I would say to that other than mm -hmm. I'm very, very sorry, because it's terrible that a disease like that yeah. took that ability away from you. Yeah, I, I feel like in America, at least there's this uh, imperialist tendency, tendency, I guess, to kind of impose one way of treating the dead as a morally correct kind of universally accepted pre-given thing and i think that's really unfortunate because it does like you were saying diminish the the importance of the ways that other cultures deal with their dead but yeah well it's wild because when when we first introduced embalming in the united states which was the late 19th century early 20th century People in the United States thought it was deeply sacrilegious mm -hmm. and deeply profane because you're talking about, you know, removing internal organs and draining the blood and, and you're desecrating the body mm -hmm. by doing that. And we've come to see embalming as a thing that's just done. And I, I would argue it's done far too much, but it is accepted as a societal thing that's done yeah. if you're not Jewish or Muslim. It's just accepted, but that's a wild, different change in the last 100 years, 150 years. So what we know, and, and this goes for anything that you're talking about, if you know, if you are so sure that you are right and you have the moral high ground and this is culture and this is how it's done, just read a history book mm. and realize that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, things were done completely differently. I came mm -hmm. across this uh, hypothesis I wanted to kind of get your opinion on and maybe ask a, a bit of a broader question. Uh, it, was, it was by uh, Ernest Becker, who uh, you've probably heard of. He was a cultural anthropologist. And he, he basically hypothesized that most of the harm conducted in, in the world is a result of a redirection of the existential threat of death. And that when we start to fear death culturally again, it gives rise to things like xenophobia and war in, in kind of this ironic way where we are in an effort to uh, rid the world of death anxiety, we are bringing about the death of others. Um, and he kind of related that to this idea of the fear of alternative conceptions of reality or different ways of viewing the world. Because when you're confronted with, like we were talking about other cultures, it tends to become its own existential threat because it undermines your own certainty in the way that you view the world. Um, now, I, part of me feels like pinning that exclusively on death is an overreach. 
but seeing how these conspiracy theories around masks and viruses have cropped up all over the place i feel like it does have a bit of explanatory power where, where people are even going just straight to denialism in order to feel like they have a sense of control so i i, I kind of wanted your thoughts on that but i guess if i was going to make that a question i i would ask do you think that a sustained conversation and acceptance of death on a broader cultural scale can address some of these serious uh, existential threats like climate change and things like that. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, unfortunately, I'm a big Ernest Becker stan, an original okay, stan. Okay. So I have, uh, you've, you've opened a can of okay, worms good. when you ask about Ernest Becker. Um, what I What I do believe to be very true is his contention that each human lives to have a hero project. That our self-esteem as human beings require us to have heroic projects. And the definition of a heroic project can mean something totally different for each person. Like having a podcast is a hero project. Mm -hmm. For me, my advocacy, my web series, my books, those are my hero projects. For some people, having children is their hero project, something to live on in the world. Uh, for some people, building a building or writing a book is a hero project. Mm -hmm. And when that is threatened or when that is cut down and their self-esteem is taken away that they've wrapped up in that hero project, that can be incredibly, as you said, existentially threatening to the very fundamental <laughs> nature of, of their being. And I do think that Donald Trump is a great example of this. He is able, and, and this is like... I don't want to say to his credit, but I will say that he has uncovered something, which is that if you walk into a culture that has trouble having conversations around death, honest, open, rational conversations around death, and you stoke the fires around death, and I don't mean saying rational things. I mean saying inflammatory things that poke at people's preconceived bigotry mm. and preconceived um, xenophobia and preconceived hero projects and notions about a certain type of, of group, if you come in and say Mexicans are rapists, mm -hmm. if you come in and say all the Black people are shooting each other in Chicago and they're going to shoot you next, yeah. if you say that you know terrorists are coming across the border and they're going to do this to you, it stokes that fear of death immediately. It's a threat. And it also reinforces their pre-existing pre -existing notions. Yeah, identity protection. And so, yeah. yeah, identity protection. So he's managed, he's managed to do that brilliantly. Yeah. And again, not to his credit, but to his something, he's managed to do that brilliantly. And the pandemic, I think, only has, has brought that to the surface even more. And... You know, there was, and, and it's not that I think Democratic politicians have handled it perfectly, mm -hmm. but I think that if everybody was able to have an open, rational conversation about death, there is this sense of like, okay, this is real, this is happening, we believe that death is bad, especially for our most vulnerable and marginalized citizens. We don't want older people to die. We don't want black people to die. We don't want lower income people to die. And because we believe that as a culture, that's our cultural hero project. That's something we all stand behind. We are all going to stay in our houses and wear masks mm. because this is something we believe because death results from this. But when you have so many different narratives flying around and you have so many different things that are existentially valuable and so many different hero projects and so few real rational discussions about death that gets convoluted and we end up where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it all really does get down to the, the sort of mes metaphysics or the sort of uh, f foundational beliefs that we, ca we take for granted and don't question, but then they come into question and that, feels like our world is falling apart i haven't heard of i haven't heard the term hero project before but it it sounds similar to uh, various philosophies of mind that will talk about the ways we kind of view ourselves as the protagonist of our own story and it kind of ex 
is used to explain, you know, this is why people will jump on a grenade to save other people or jump in front of a bus mm-hmm. to save someone, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that, that's really interesting. So to kind of uh, pivot from that, I am I did want to ask if you know, having done and seen everything you've done and having put out such a breadth of information, is does death still surprise you in new ways? Have you is there anything substantial you've changed your mind on or or discovered? Hmm. I I try to let it change my mind. Mm-hmm. I try to learn new things all the time. I, I was thinking last night, actually, I'm preparing for a, I'm doing a book tour, or no, not a real book tour, a virtual book mm-hmm. tour, which I guess is real now. <laughs> and I was, we're talking about at one event, we're doing my death book library. And I found this book that I read years ago, but I ended up using it in my first book about cannibalism in this tribe in rural Brazil called the Wari. Mm and how they do in-group cannibalism. They, it's not mm-hmm. the direct you know, spouse or child of the person who's died, but the in-laws will consume the person because it's an incredible gift to the immediate family mm-hmm. to know that the body's not in the cold ground. And it's not a pleasurable experience. They're not eating it for food. They're doing it to support and keep the community tight-knit. And I remember reading that and feeling in the moment where I felt sort of burned out on all this research, Mm. being like, wow, this has blown my mind open. Mm. This is something I didn't know and didn't understand prior to reading this this piece of anthropology. Mm. And it's moments like that at this point that I live for because they're the moments where I'm like, oh, right, this is so interesting. I have the best job in the world. Yeah, And I do still get <laughs> yeah. really excited, uh, especially when I do um, like videos now where I co- I'm reading some book and I come across some mention of, oh, by the way, this person was like embalmed and buried under a house for 12 years. And, you know, then finally got, and I'm just like, wait a second, I don't know this story. Let me do a little research. Mm. And then I buy another book. And then we go, and then you go <laughs> down the rabbit mm-hmm. hole and all of a sudden you have this absolutely becomes an iconic corpse episode. Mm. That's about the journey that this particular dead body took. That's different from any other journey that a dead body is ever taken and you know those moments are the moments that i still get really excited and it's not that i i love i love i love talking about aquamation new death technology i love talking Mm -hmm. about green burial i love talking about embalming i love talking about the basics and because that's my what my advocacy is primarily built on but for me at this point i'm so steeped in it and have been for so many years that when i can find some new thing that i haven't heard of or that changes my perception on a body or as a story that is weird and wonderful those are sort of the moments that i live for i do love the way you talk about the dead even just there the the sort of there's a, a sort of a sense of um imbuing agency and and in the ways that the dead still continue to make meaning in our own lives and therefore sort of gives them their own they be, become agentic in, in a sense and i i really like that concept Thank you. Yeah, I I firmly believe that that death is culture. Death is a part of our culture. The story of our deaths is the story of culture. And so it doesn't make sense to me that you cut someone's life off at their Mm -hmm. death. Because the ways, you know, even if you look at sort of a celebrity like Michael Jackson, continuing to influence culture for better or worse you know, yeah. conti- or Brianna Taylor, for example, mm-hmm. massively. I think all the time I watch the NBA, which makes me not very goth, but I love the <laughs> NBA. Um, and, you know, they've they've turned into Brianna Taylor on all their jerseys and all their shoes. Yeah. Imagine if Brianna Taylor had known what was going to happen and what her life was going to stand for and mean and the way that her narrative continues to shape culture because of because of this death and why we're so angry about her death and how it happened mm. and why we feel like the state shouldn't intervene in people's lives and deaths yeah. and all of that is death and culture and it just gives me chills to see how it's all connected yeah 
Uh, going back to something we kind of kind of briefly mentioned uh, earlier on talking about your career, I've uh, having having been goth most of my life, I've talked to many, many other goths who either in jest or in a serious way have uh, expressed an interest in working in a cemetery or a funeral home or uh, being a mortician. And um, I, I think I only know one or two people who have actually gone to school and gotten careers in that field. But I, because this is something that comes up just drinking in a kitchen at two in the morning with other goths, I wanted to see if, if you could kind of explain what to actually expect when working in that field um, uh, <laughs> beyond what I assume involves a lot of silk capes and vampire parties and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly goth. <laughs> it's fun all the time. <laughs> You'll just, you know, play no mountain as you embalm. It's just <laughs> incredible. Um, I would say expect, you know, you're entering, if you want to be part of the funeral industry, you're entering an industry. It is an industry. And the problems that you have with whatever current industry you're working in, you may very well continue to have mm. by entering the funeral industry. Um, should it be better? Yes. Is it? Probably not. In most states, it requires at least two years of schooling, some sort. Also, should it be that way? Probably not. Is it? Yes. Mm. Um, it requires like an associate's degree, a certain amount of embalming training, and some sort of internship, whether it's an embalmer or funeral director, you know, depending on what type of uh, part of the industry you're trying to go into. Mm. Most likely, you will have to work for either a corporation or a nice mom and pop place, but that still has some pretty old fashioned values around it. Um, so you'd have to cover up any tattoos, mm. cover up any piercings and be very nice to the widows that are coming in to do it. You have to be very pro-social. You have to be able to have those kind of hard conversations and you know, it's not being a funeral director is a very, it's almost like a customer service job, mm, to be honest. Yeah. I would say that that mm -hmm. is the, that is the closest. Oh, yeah. It's like a party planner slash customer service <laughs> representative. Right. Mm -hmm. And embalmers, you know, it's, it's, there are some places where you can be exclusively an embalmer and exclusively work with the dead bodies, but most places will require you to do multiple things. Um, unless you work for a big centralized corporation that has like, you know, house of embalming in the middle of town, mm. you probably will be required to do a whole bunch of different things. Um, and that's actually for me, what I really liked about the job when I first started doing it, that I never knew what the next day was going to bring, you know, am I picking up a dead, you know, arson victim mm. from the coroner's office? Am I going to the hospital? Am I meeting a family? And am I, am I doing a, witness cremation you know each day was its own thing am i washing the van who knows um and i actually really liked that about it so i will say that there is a lot of novelty but but the number one thing that i would recommend is one try and get even just an entry level simple job in the industry before you commit to mortuary school and the testing and the whole thing mm -hmm. because it's not for everyone and you might not know if you like it yeah. And the other thing is that there's a pretty high burnout rate because it's a hard job um, mentally, I mean, and uh, emotionally. But if you have something else to keep you going, like what has kept me going is I'm an advocate and I'm a historian and I care about all this stuff mm. <laughs> so much that, you know, owning a funeral home is almost like is I, I will say this unequivocally owning a funeral home and the logistics behind being an owner and doing all the taxes is by far the least interesting part about me mm. in my life. Okay. Yeah. So if you don't have other things that you're invested in and other narratives that you're invested in that weave together with it, it also might not be the right job for you. Yeah. Do you find that you grow accustomed to being around dead bodies uh, over time or is it still... You, you you know, you mentioned how emotionally difficult it was. Is that uh, still difficult now? I still get, well, the emotionally difficult part, I would say, is dealing with the families, not so much the, the dead bodies. Although, of course, if you have a 
<laughs> horrible fear of dead bodies that will also sure, be emotionally yeah. difficult um i i find that dead bodies still give me a little thrill not a mm. salacious thrill just like a a thrill of seeing a human in a different state right. yeah. you know like you're in a coffee shop and in pre-pandemic times and you're surrounded by 15 people and you don't even notice them you're not even aware of them mm. and then you walk into a body cooler and there are 15 corpses there you're very aware of them you know all of a sudden these people in a different state it's it's a really um you know it's a it's a fascinating feeling yeah to, to sense that difference and even you know i now i i Honestly, I, I hardly see any dead bodies at all because I'm the owner. I'm not the person in the trenches. But I worked for years. I was a long haul corpse trucker. So I was taking, you know, transporting 15 bodies a day, hauling them in and out. I worked at crematories that, that cremated hundreds, if not thousands of bodies every year. Um, so I've been around uh, the bulk of dead bodies in my life. But I would still say that they continue to be interesting mm -hmm. and continue to tell stories, not out loud, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. with their with their presence and how they died and and what their you know what their history was, yeah. what their families like, and I I still find them very interesting, and that's another thing that that keeps me going. Mm. I remember the the first time I saw a dead body was at a, an open casket funeral, and I don't remember anything else other than I distinctly remember my my dad telling me that uh, I'm an atheist now but I asked why he looked why my uh, grandfather looked so strange and he said oh that's because his soul has left his body uh, but I've <laughs> come to realize I think that's probably because he was embalmed and they, they, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a that's a great story actually I'm sorry if it was traumatizing for you but that is <laughs> that's a that's a story that really hits home I think for so many uh people our age of the feeling of and it's something about i don't know if it's like a millennial thing or a gen x thing but but this feeling of i i look at an un, i look at an embalmed body and it feels uncanny mm -hmm. for me it doesn't feel like necessarily the right way to grieve it doesn't necessarily feel like um it resonates with me the way that other methods of of grieving might yeah there's like an artifice to the way it's mm -hmm. presented yeah and and that and that's by design you know that's entirely by design i just think it's a design that maybe aesthetic you know we don't have the same uh shag carpeting right, that right. we used to in the 70s yeah. like design mm -hmm. and aesthetics change yeah. and i think that this is a a thing that has has changed yeah. and the funeral industry has not necessarily adapted along with it right. In our uh, in our previous interview with Lauren Rhodes, she mentioned that uh, she she basically said she has a seemingly different, more solemn perspective on death than some of her, um, I guess, death positive colleagues, which she attributed to her age. And then I, I recently listened to an interview with a uh, social psychologist uh, uh, Sheldon Solomon, and he he mentioned that despite dedicating his career to being a proponent of death familiarity he still struggles with death anxiety as he ages and sometimes he feels like his he's used his work to well he said he kind of goes back and forth but sometimes he feels like he's used his work to intellectualize death as a kind of coping mechanism so i wanted to ask if if any of that compares against your own life and do you feel like we can i guess eliminate at least individually um that existential anxiety of death that's a fantastic question um i will be very firm on this i do not think the goal is to not be afraid of death mm. at all i absolutely do not think that the goal is some sort of zen complete acceptance of death i mean mm. if you if you believe that you can reach that and that's your goal more power to you i wish i had more of that but that's not the goal of my particular movement or, or my understanding of it. I think that death is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly existentially threatening. And the goal is not to not be afraid of it. The goal is to be self-aware enough to know why you're afraid of it. So, and something I was going to say, mention earlier when we were talking about Ernest Becker is I believe that death is the real key to self-awareness which i think he mm. does as well yeah i do too that 
if you really engage with the reality of death and why you're terrified of death, it will tell you a lot about yourself mm-hmm. and and things and and I, and the things that that tend to affect me the most personally and, and mentally are things that threaten my work because my work is my hero project mm-hmm. and my work is to help people be better with death and if i die too early then i can't keep doing my work right. you know it all <laughs> it all connects and the fact that i can rattle all that off to you i hope shows some self awareness on my mm-hmm. part i'm not proud of it but it is what it is it is my relationship with death right. it is the things that i work on it is the things that i have to focus on and I do feel incredibly grateful that because of my work, I have the ability to interrogate those things. I have the ability to see it all laid out mm-hmm. and try to understand myself better. Because you know this, you, everyone in your life, you have people who you know have not been doing a great job at interrogating yeah. <laughs> their relationship yeah. to the world and their relationship to their own mortality and their relationship to so many things. And I do think a more practical relationship with death can really help that. And if you stir up some shit, that is hard. But you're doing something rational and beneficial for yourself by doing it. And at the end of the day, I have to I have to support that. That is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's great. Um, So I wanted to close out the show by asking a couple questions that I felt were more in keeping with kind of the spirit of Ask a Mortician and, and really, uh, will my uh, cat eat my eyeballs? Uh, so so both of these questions are based on memes, um, because that's where all the greatest thinkers exist these days. So the first question um, comes from, actually, it was someone who had minor fame in the goth industrial scene during the mid 2000s. But so this me- mm-hmm. this meme has been around for a long time. But it basically stated something along the lines of, uh, he was saying that he feels satisfied knowing that every homophobe of the last few decades is spending eternity with a butt plug firmly screwed into their ass. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to see if you could explain what's going on with that. Sure. So it's called an AV plug, which is a anal vaginal plug. And if you haven't seen this meme, it basically looks like a little twisted dildo a little plastic twisted dildo Mm -hmm. that is used in the funeral industry because and what's interesting is that like (laughs) if you are like a a homophobe you're no i i have no evidence to support that if you're a homophobe you're more likely to be embalmed i'm just saying that in traditional communities Mm -hmm. (laughs) or like traditional uh christian communities or Mm -hmm. or whatnot that there tends to be more embalming there um, so, you know, don't quote me on that stat, but I should, I really should break down that meme and see if I can prove that that is true. Maybe that's another video. Maybe you've given me a video idea here. Wonderful. See, my I can still get done. excited about these things. Um, but for, so for example, at my funeral home, we do not use AV plugs because okay. we're a more natural funeral home. We, you know, we're not trying to use plastic we're not trying to use those things and we're not embalming which means that there's less likely to be what they call leakage in the funeral industry where things can come out of holes when you don't necessarily Mm -hmm. want them to Mm -hmm. so the av plug is used to plug up that particular orifice so it does not leak during and the nice satin lining of the casket during a viewing right now that I know that's optional, I'll have to put that in my death plan that I want something in it's my It's definitely ass. optional. Uh, <laughs> although another option is, you know, lightly sewing up the yeah, the anus yeah. as well. Or packing cotton up there or just doing nothing at all, which is yeah, what we do. Yeah. Uh, so then the second question or the second meme, I guess, that this one I saw recently uh, in the last few weeks. And I think it was from Twitter, but the, the person was essentially expressing their anger that uh they said uh, funeral homes always put bras on women for showings um yeah yeah I, yeah i i saw i got tagged in that a lot uh, yeah um i think that also depends on the type of funeral home you're going to the way that bodies tend to be laid out for a more quote unquote traditional or conventional viewing where the body's been embalmed is if you don't you know contain the breasts during the embalming process or you don't do something after the embalming process they tend to spread and flop because of gravity 
So you do, you probably do want to do something just to make mom or grandma in the casket look, you know, a certain way. But at the same time, if you come to a funeral home like mine and grandma is just shrouded or she's just laid out and, and she's not embalmed and she's looking very natural, mm-hmm. in that case, we, we probably would not bother with a bra. Yeah. It's not necessary. Um, especially if she's going to a natural burial after it, because you're not allowed right. to have fabrics that aren't all natural, that aren't cotton, that aren't hemp, that aren't something like that. So unless grandma has an all hemp bra, <laughs> um, it's, you know, th- that wouldn't go in there anyway. So um, I don't think it, if, I, I think it, again, it depends on whether or not you want the body to look a certain way and be contained in a certain way. Whereas I personally like death to be a little more messy, a little floppier, yeah. if you will. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That a little freer. Lovely, wonderful. Thank you for clearing that up. No bras, no <laughs> AV plugs at my funeral home. Um... I'm going to have to find an all hemp AV plug just for from, just from me. Keep that, on my, <laughs> keep that on my bedside stand. I actually had a quick question since we were talking sure. about a lot, especially around the the other traditions and other things. I'm curious if you've ever encountered in in all your research and travels and whatnot, uh, particularly enjoyable or amusing, either celebration or Mm. tradition that really, you know, caught your eye, made you made you maybe smile or or made you happy about how some group or culture experiences death. Hmm. I mean, I have it's like choosing between my children Mm. on that. Fair. I have so many. I think what I, what I've been really interested in lately is the idea of extreme embalmings. You're probably familiar with this. These are the people that they have special secret formulas. Mm-hmm. It's popular in New Orleans. It's popular in Puerto Rico, where they pose the dead in some position, riding yeah. a motorcycle, oh, sitting yeah, in a barca lounger, right. sitting with a cigarette in there and a cigarette holder, um, a boxer standing up in the ring. And for me, it's kind of the natural conclusion of embalming. It's embalming much more towards a purpose, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, because for the average embalmed body, there's not necessarily a purpose to it other than making it easier to put makeup and a suit on the body for the funeral director, Um, easier to present it to the family in that way. But there's not truly a purpose for it. But if you're posing someone on their John Deere tractor and they have to sit up for the, <laughs> for the whole wake, yeah, that's a purpose for this extreme embalming. And it's so it pushes the limit so far in its absurdity that I think it comes back around to being very relatable and interesting. And that, I think, is my current favorite yeah. death tradition. I really like that because it also, you know, we always talk about how uh, at least in the death positive circles to some degrees, the the purpose of a funeral is not to mourn the dead, but to celebrate the life that has passed. And something like that, where you're involving someone and then putting them into a pose or a situation or an environment that celebrates something that may have meant something very much to them in their life or something they were really well known for, um, is a great way to put that emphasis on this is why you loved so-and-so. This is what their great benefit to the world was while they were alive. And let's memorialize them eternally in that rather than right. being memorialized as somebody sleeping in a box. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like dad didn't love chemicals. You know, that wasn't like his favorite thing, <laughs> but you know, maybe he loved the Green Bay Packers or maybe he loved you know, sitting in his chair or he loved motorcycle racing or whatever it was. And I think people, because I advocate for making choices other than embalming, I think people would think that I would be against this or I wouldn't be interested in this. Um, but in fact, quite the opposite. I think that it's it's quite charming. And again, it uses embalming as a tool to help people grieve in a new, interesting way mm. that I, I don't think embalming serves on a normal dead body yeah i guess in uh, conjunction that i wanted to share it's not really a death practice or a ritual but it is a celebration that occurs in the united states um around a specific death so it sort of memorializes a a specific death but have you uh heard of the uh coffin races that occur in manitou springs colorado no but they have dead guy days there too right they do there are a lot of there are a lot of celebrations out in yeah colorado is a real deathy place it is all the weed 
<laughs> <laughs> it's a really deathy place, man. Yeah. So the the I guess the inception of the tradition was Manitou Springs used to be one of those, as all of the springs in Colorado, uh, destination number one for those suffering from tuberculosis. Because, of course, these natural mm. hot springs were the cure-all that oh, okay. always solved tuberculosis, which basically meant a lot of people died in Colorado of tuberculosis mm -hmm. um, because they all went there. So there was one woman who went there, uh, it was Emma, Emma Crawford, and she went there to treat her tuberculosis, but she also fell in love with the area. And her wish was when she died, she wanted to be buried at the top of this one mountain. I think it was Red Mountain or something like that in the outskirts of Manitou Springs. And she did eventually pass, and um, they did honor her wish. They had a bunch of people went up, and they buried her at the top of this mountain. Um, this was around 1889. Uh, unfortunately, because of the weather there, after about 40 years of harsh winters and rain and all of that, natural process of, of erosion unearthed her coffin, and it then plummeted down the mountain in sort of a, a mudslide as this just coffin racing down the hill in the 1920s to be found. And so they started memorializing this. I think it started in 1995, which is a long time afterwards, as they've done this coffin race. It's kind of evocative of that. They aren't like racing down the mountain in uh, like a bobsled, but it's just done on the, 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 mental, the central street of the town. They have a bunch of you know, local organizations, whether like the Firemen's Union or a local 4-H or just a bunch of different organizations from the community will put together a coffin race car, uh, basically a coffin on wheels. They have one person who is Emma, who rides as the driver inside <laughs> the coffin, and then four people who are pushing. And they, they do a race, oh, wow. and whoever can go fastest down. They're usually wildly decorated. People are in costumes. There's a whole themed thing there. Um, and they just do it once a year, every year, though, unfortunately, with the current pandemic, I believe they said it was canceled this year. But uh, Well, next year, I would like someone to invite me to be the Emma. In yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I mean, if you, get to know, if you get to know a group there that are willing to let you do that, I'm sure more than, people are more than happy to, though I would suspect the Emma role is probably a pretty popular one because they could just get to sit in the casket and yeah. ride <laughs> rather than having to push. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the sort of like grand marshal of the parade <laughs> kind of role. Yeah, but I mean, there's a whole parade Call around me, it. Someone in Colorado. Yeah, but there's, yeah, there's a whole parade before it and then they have the races and a lot of, you know, it's great how many of the organizations in the community participate. Um, it's not just a bunch of, it's not the local goth club exclusively and, and local funeral directors, but, you know, they've got all sorts of unions and news organizations, the local newspaper put up people, the local police department will put up people. So it's just a lot of, it's a very community oriented civic pride kind of, this is a celebration that we do in Manitou Springs. And I just found that so great. I really loved it. Yeah. I love it. We need we need that same thing in every town. Not that exact thing, because every town does not have a rogue coffin sliding down <laughs> sure. the mountain. But find that thing in your own town and create a community event around Yeah, something it. that can put some manner of joy around what may have been a, tr a tragedy or just around death so it's not a taboo. It's just out there in the open and correlated with joy rather than mm. purely sorrow. Yeah, yeah you're, I love it. You're right that goths aren't generally into sports but i feel like that's some physical activity i could get behind uh so maybe we'll form a team for next year or something goths would be more interested in sports if they all took place in coffee yes yeah, exactly i assume exactly that's fair yeah all right well again your newest book is will my cat eat my eyeballs i highly recommend picking it up it is uh, uh just as witty and humorous and informative as the ask a mortician content that we've all come to love over the years so i will be sure to have a link to that and your channel and everything in the show notes so everybody go check that out um but otherwise that's it Kate, caitlin this has been a pleasure yeah thank you so much this is a great interview caitlin thank you again so much for hanging out with us now if this is your first time listening to the podcast and you enjoyed this episode, may I suggest you check out two previous episodes where we interviewed other members of Order of the Good Death. One of them we mentioned, or I mentioned on this episode, and that was with Lauren Rhodes. She's the author of 199 Cemeteries to See Before You Die. 
And we have also interviewed Bess Lovejoy previously, uh, who authored Rest in Pieces, The Curious Fates of Famous Corpses. Those are two other uh, excellent episodes, I believe. That said, if you are a normal listener of this podcast, I do have some news that I would like to share relating to the future of this show. Uh, so if this is your first episode and you're not interested in this kind of thing, feel free to go check out those other episodes or take a look at our back catalog. There's all kinds of interesting uh, interviews and and things discussed there. But this is something that uh, I've been considering over the last few months, and I've been trying to push this off as far as I could. Honestly, like I've pushed this farther than my mental health uh, would like me to, but we are going to be reducing the number of shows that we produce back down to one per month. Uh, if you'll remember, we started putting out two episodes a month a couple years ago after we reached a goal on Patreon. This is this is ideally going to be a temporary reduction. At least it'll be for the end of this year. I don't know about next year yet. For those of you on Patreon, I am going to continue putting up content. So I've already recorded a couple videos, and I've got more in the works. Uh, but you can expect on the 16th of this month for there to be a, a Patreon-only video uh, for you as a thank you for your support. But when it comes to the decision to lower the number of shows back down to where we started, I mean, I'll be candid with you. This this show is my life's work. It really, as corny as it sounds, is is kind of my magnum opus. I've I've tried doing similar projects in different formats over my whole life, and this is the one that is really the culmination of my life's work in a way. And it's also a result of my passion and love for the goth scene, which is very dear to me and an integral part of my identity. This year has been hard for everyone, um, and I'm no exception. Many of you know already this is essentially my third job. I have two other jobs, and then I do this as well. But I also have a family and my own personal hobbies. And if I'm being honest with myself, those two things, my family included, very often take a back seat to my work and this podcast. My son is doing schooling from home this year. And if you don't have kids, um, I guess I can describe it as briefly as essentially having another job. Dealing with that, obviously I'm not doing it only by myself here, but it's been more work, time, and energy than I thought it would be. I love this show deeply, but I also love my family. And in an effort to avoid burning out and hurting my family, or hurting you, honestly, because it's going to impact the quality of the show, um, I've decided to reduce the show from twice a month to once a month. This is something I continued to push off, and honestly, I, I got to the point where nearly every day I was very close to just completely shutting the show down because I was on the edge of a breakdown every day. And that is not something I want to do because of my love for the show and because of my love for you. I don't want to do that to you either. And so I'm trying to you to to do something that can fall somewhere in the middle and keep the show going because I think the show is important. You know, I, I'm a fan of a lot of different creators. And I know the pain of finding a connection and a safe space in other people's content and then having that disappear. 
And I have been so proud of how this podcast has persevered and consistently released episodes for years, especially in the goth space where that's less common. But on the flip side of that, of being a fan of other creators, that's also made this decision even more painful because I also need an escape. I also need to hear the voices of people that I trust or that make me laugh or that teach me something uh, to kind of reassure me and calm me down. And if this show is that for you or anyone out there, I don't want to take that away and I want to give you as much as I can. But in the process of that, I've kind of ignored really for years my limits and pushing those pushing beyond those for so long has not been healthy for me when i was younger goth magazines were a massive influence on my life because this was before open access to the internet and these were windows into a world that i wanted to be a part of and i'm still sad that those have disappeared now but that's the kind uh, that's kind of what i modeled this podcast on and so even though i want to put out more content honestly if i could put out a show every week i would um i also don't want to crash and burn and have this show just disappear because it breaks my heart now that those public publications are gone and it would i know it would break my heart if i had to stop doing the show especially for me looking back at the episodes we've done this year which i think have been some of our best ever and i i want to continue that quality i don't want to just put out shows to put out shows it's i mean this isn't really that kind of thing it's not a Twitch channel, right, where you pop on somebody that you enjoy and uh, hang out for six hours and just talk about nothing. That's not the purpose of this show. But because of the rigor and research and quality assurance that I at least attempt to put into it, uh, the bar for the amount of work that goes into this show is, even if it's something I arbitrarily hold myself to, it's very high. And I also want to be clear, though, it's not just me. This show would also not exist without Trey and without the guests who so generous, generously lend their time to this show and to our supporters on Patreon. I've said this before, but if I didn't have the incredible and generous people that support this podcast on Patreon, I wouldn't be able to justify producing the show anymore due to the sheer tax it takes on my life and the time it takes away from my family when this is a time in the in our history that they kind of need and I need their moral support more than ever before and when this show doing this podcast is taking care and attention and time that they need to feel loved and to love and care back away from from us uh and causing uh, uh pain in that way that's just not something that i can do anymore so in a way you know i'm 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 actually having to force myself away from doing more shows because intellectually even though i very am very passionate i know that it's doing active harm in my life right now but my instinct and desire is actually the opposite is to just work harder and longer and make more content so that's why uh, i haven't mentioned this until now even though this has been ongoing for almost this whole year so i can't promise a return date for when we may go back to, to doing two episodes a, a year, a month. That's absolutely a goal of mine. But all I know is that for now, 
at least for the end of the year, we're going to be just putting out one episode a month. So in the interest of letting you know what we have coming up, next month we are having DJ Mary Millions and Sean Dietra on the podcast. They do, uh, right now they're DJs out of Texas, but they're doing Sisters of Mondays on Twitch. And we're going to be talking about what it's like to be a DJ in a pandemic. We're also going to be just chatting about general goth stuff because we haven't done it, something like that recently. So I want you all to know that I care about you. I am so grateful that you have been here with me. For those of you on Patreon, expect some new content on the 16th. And that's something I'm going to continue through the end of the year. So even though it's not a full episode, you will have some kind of video content um, on Patreon. And if if you do would like to uh, see that content or just support the show, you can go head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions uh, and take a look at our uh, tier rewards. So that's it for me. Thank you for spending some time with us. Until next time, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information.